Go you got Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so we are live. We are live on Zoom. We are live on YouTube also. So for everybody that is here on the live stream, thank you for attending. Thank you for being here again. This is another Crypto Wednesday show. This is number 20 to be precise. So man, 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 man. What, what started off as an initiative just a couple of months ago, me and Gordon saying, you know, what can we do as a as a tribute as, as a payback to the industry how can we share knowledge in our our network and this is what's going on so every week we are here today we have loretta and austin in the show uh, we're very happy to have you here we are all in different parts of the world but before we get started for everybody that's here on the live show if there's anything that you would like to bring to the table towards our guest speakers uh, for the first part of the show please use the chat box to put your questions or your comments in and the second part of the show, we will open up the mics and the videos also, so to be a more interactive uh, 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 part, of, part of the show. So that being said, before I hand over to my good friend Gordon, uh, just a little intro. My name is Sander de Bruin. I'm now broadcasting from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, which is a really cool country in Europe. Uh, we are semi-lockdown, so we are getting back on, back on track. Uh, I got involved in the crypto and blockchain industry for a couple of years ago. Originally, I come from the fitness and health and also nutrition industry. Um, nowadays, I'm also partnering up with a really cool project, which is called Europe Chain. Tomorrow morning, Central European time, 10 a.m., we have our first online business opportunity presentation for everybody that's watching that's also curious on good investment opportunities. Contact me. I'll send you the, the Zoom link to join that call. But today is all about our guests, Loretta and Austin. And be before we give, uh, give them the mic, Gordon, uh, you're still in LA, but I heard a rumor on the grapevine that you've got some ambitions coming coming over to Europe, right? Yes. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. It is 5.30 in the morning in Los Angeles. So you know what? Crypto never sleeps. And this is the highest <laughs> energy show in crypto. And I'm proof. And you know what? This is not coffee. <laughs> this is tea. Okay, tea, and you know, this is me on tea. Imagine me on coffee. So good morning, everyone. And this is appropriate because this show is all about the future, the brave new world of energy and power. You know, we always, you know, despite the name or maybe because of the name, you know, crypto is not just about Bitcoin. It's not just about blockchain. It's about a philosophy. It's about an approach. It's about politics. And, you know, as you, everyone knows, our shows go deep. Uh, we go wide, and I'm happy to be branching into this topic. And yes, Sandra, I'm in Los Angeles. You know, you can see the window behind me. It is dark outside. As the show progresses, it's going to turn light. So I have graphical proof of my time zone, if not my exact <laughs> location. So, you know, it's proof of time zone. It's a new kind of proof on the blockchain. Um, and yes, I. it looks like I'm going to be, I'm, one way or another, I'm busting out of here not super soon, but not super far. I think we're looking at the end of February. Off to Kiev I go. And of course, then I get to see my friends in Europe, finally. Um, and so I'm excited. So I, I want to, let's just, you know, quick thing we always have to say, you know, this is Zoom. Whoever, you know, no one on this call is going to do this, but if we Zoom bomb you, like we're all adults, you can say little nasty words. We don't care. We're going to eliminate you and laugh at you because that's what we do. Okay. <laughs> you are just fresh meat to us. So bring it on, little Zoom bombers. Okay, Loretta is feeling my vibe right now, and I can tell she's into it. Hey, Loretta. So <laughs> again, you know, I want to, I want to thank our guests. I want to thank Austin. I want to thank Loretta. I want to give a, I'll give it Loretta a separate shout out. But I want to thank especially Austin. You know, this is a last minute thing. Um, we're moving some panels around. Hence, we're doing two shows today. I'm happy to say this oh. is the first time we've really done two panels on one day. You know, I guess sleep is optional in crypto because we're all on, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm on UTC time now. Like, I don't even have a time zone anymore. It's all kind of messed up. But Austin, you know, great to get to know you recently. Um, I'm fascinated by your interest, interest in energy and power. Thank you for you know introducing us to Loretta, who I was looking at her bio and her history and just her, ge her <clears throat> geography. It's like a tale and a story in itself. So Yeah, we might just have to let Loretta talk the entire hour here. I think we'd all be <laughs> Honestly, that might be best, uh, buddy. So I'll, I'll just need two. No, just kidding. Okay, so Sandra, are, are I'll we just ready? I'll take my coffee. All good. Right, Sandra, are we ready to dive in? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're fully ready. We are live on all the channels. Everybody's okay. here. So, okay, let's so, get I, so ladies first, Loretta. Tell us, tell us the Loretta origin tale. You know, there's like Wolverine origins. I want Loretta origin. <laughs> all right. Okay. Give, give, us, give us some stick on yourself. 
So hi everybody, I, my name is Loretta. I live in Mauritius at the moment. I'm Australian, as you can tell by my accent. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, happy hump day. It's 5.30 in the afternoon for me in the middle of the Indian Ocean in Mauritius. And I think we're quite international. I think we're covered with both continents. Um, so welcome to your Wednesday, whatever part of it is. We're almost on the end of the week. Um, I, I was for a number of years, as you can tell, I'm not that young. I'm not one of the crypto the crypto kittens. Um, I, I was a derivatives trader for almost 30 years. I've run, run, run two global banks. I've traded every asset class, I think, known to man. I started my life in 1991 trading three-year options on a floor with a piece of paper and a pencil. So anybody in DeFi that tells me that they're smart and intelligent, if I hadn't had the, t the technology back in 1991, I would have had a, a gun arbitrage trader in thir three seconds as well. Um, so I got into crypto. I bought my first book, Bitcoin, at $40 as an experiment. I really wish I had bought more now. Um, I left Better Banker and I looked at this as a new asset class. I was really excited. I ended up building a clearing settlement system for security exchanges in 2015. I challenged the Australian government in 2015 because I told them their laws were not technology agnostic, which they told me to go sort off. And I said I wouldn't. So I had the Australian Corporations Law changed then. That was my first intro to regulation. Um, then I tried to buy some Bitcoin, which I found very convoluted. So I wrote the first self-regulation for Bitcoin in the world, which we did in Australia. And we just started talking about digital assets. So before then, people were talking about crypto assets, digital assets, virtual assets. And um, there was no one definition. And I was saying, what, what, what are we talking about? Nobody could give me an answer, whether that be somebody who ran a government or ran a bank. So I said, all right, well, let's figure this out. So um, I said, then let's all just use the one term. So I came up with the term digital asset in Australia back then. So we started referring to um, everything that we could digitalize, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, I guess, are just tokenizations of money. But now we can digitalize everything. I mean, you know, a kilowatt hour of energy. It's exciting. A gold bar. We can tokenize any asset class that we've ever seen in history um, and open up liquidity pools and new asset markets that we've never even thought about. So that was exciting. So I started writing regulation um, just about that. As I said, I'm not a lawyer. I went to Bermuda. I wrote the first regulations around digital assets in Bermuda in 2018 and the first regulations on ICOs, initial coin offerings. I'm still not a lawyer. Um, and that went into um, that went into Parliament, got passed. Since then, I've worked across maybe 19 jurisdictions. I've written law in seven, including including Serbia, Mauritius. Um, I work across a number of central banks now, maybe 19. I have the largest WhatsApp group of central bank governors in the world, and I can tell you what they eat for breakfast because wow. they like to post photos of that. And I work for a number of um, a number of emerging countries, um, writing regulations around what are digital assets. So I work for the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, that's a fun one. Mm -hmm. um, I work across law enforcement around the world. Wait, I, I'm sorry, Loretta, are, are those the people that are sending me, I have to make this joke, are those the ones sending me the emails that, that someone owes me $400 million? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just, just answer those ones. Okay, I'll, I'll no, take but what it did, um, but no, yeah, Nigeria, I mean, and it's interesting for me because these markets where we say, oh, we laugh, but you know, where are we going to have the most impact with technology? It's mm -hmm. it's the emerging world, Latin America, um, India and, and Africa. If COVID and Nigeria is huge. I mean, thing, it's the largest population in Africa, I think. Yeah, it is. Nigeria's got 260 million people. And to, believe you me, the fear is real. Right. Um, Mauritius is a tiny island. We sit off the coast of Madagascar. We've got the smallest population, 1.3 million in, in um, sub-Sahara, Africa. We've got the highest GDP. So we're a financial services centre, which is very interesting because we have no natural resources. Um, so I've sat in Mauritius for the last three years. I've written the first custody regulation in the world about how the hell you hold a digital asset because I can tell you no banker will have any clue how to do that. I've done security token regulations and I'm just about writing um, regulations for cryptocurrency exchanges, which I refuse to call exchanges because they're just asset, they're just marketplaces where they match buyers and sellers. Mm. So I guess I try and um, bond between the two worlds, the very old world that I come from, which I hated, the very centralised world of old school banking, um, you know, governments, and I think I was regulated in 50 countries. And then this very new world of, of, of blockchain um, and a bunch of very young technologists who just generally don't really um, float the boat of a, of, a, of a regulator or someone who runs a government or a central bank. But... Um, so, but I think there's a common language there and, and if the internet taught us something, the walled garden approach 
to how we look at, at technology. And um, my very good mentor actually is Robert Kahn, who built the internet. So I, I've learned a lot about coding and um, you know, the, the, the work behind the internet, the number of protocols that have been stacked on top of that. So I just see, you know, blockchain now has been an infrastructure and we won't be talking about it in 15 years. But because some person, Satoshi called Bitcoin, Bitcoin, all central banks got upset because they thought it was money and it was currency. And then we had initial coin offerings. So, and we call things exchanges. So we've had this problem with terminology, I guess. And if we could all sort of start to use the same terminology and not confuse ourselves across different, um, you know, different, different mandates of different regulators, we'd all be on a better path to having technology accepted a lot quicker. Um, Decentralisation is awesome. And I think- Actually, let, me, let, me pause, let me pause one second. That's a- I mean, by the way, I love interrupting, but, and if I interrupt, it's a sign I'm interested. Okay, so that, that's that's just for the rest of the show. So I, I love a point you just made, which is developing a common vocabulary helps develop the international regulation. It's not just a common regulatory framework. It's like actually coming up with common yeah. words, common definitions, a common argot, if you will. That's I haven't heard it quite put that way before, and I like that. So, yeah, I mean, had they have called Bitcoin Zen token, nobody would have given a shit. Excuse my French mm -hmm. today. Like, we are, had we, nobody would have cared. No central bank governor, no securities regulator would have been up in arms. Yeah, Zen tokens wouldn't have been, you know, upsetting to anyone. But the minute you put coin or currency or use words like exchange, you upset a whole lot of people that are baby boomers that don't understand what the hell you're talking about. And they get, when people don't understand stuff, their general response is to say no or ban it. Fair enough. And, and then do you, you know, the, the, our last minute topic is energy and power. Is there an intersection between what you're doing, for, which is a ton, you know, what you're doing professionally and the zone or what, what's, what's the interface other than yes, awesome that's, cool? that's how Austin and I know each other. So I've been really interested. One of the best use cases I see for blockchain is in peer-to-peer -peer trading of electricity. Like, you know, Australia is very gridded. I think like the US and Europe, it's bloody expensive. So why can't I, as a person, and by going away for the weekend, share my electricity with the person next door and be paid for that? So I found, um, that's why I guess Austin and I met, I found one of the best use cases outside the tokenization of money is the tokenization of, say, a kilowatt hour of energy. Mm. But, and, and it all comes together because now this whole concept of tokenization with what Ethereum did has really opened up some really funky new you know, models, business models and, and, and um, things we can trade as assets that we've never even dreamed about. And I think that's really exciting. So I find energy great because it also democratizes, like the internet democratized media, um, Bitcoin democratized money, and I think blockchain will democratize energy. And that is huge for the, like for the emerging world that I'm talking about, where we take electricity for granted that we have it every day. I live in Mauritius. You know, we have six, seven power outages a day. Um, when you don't have these things... You, you know, you, I'm sorry, you do or you did? We do at the moment. So, you know, that's what happens when you live on an island. I, I think something weird's going on. But if in the emerging world in Nigeria, like you know, and South Africa over COVID, they had no electricity for six, seven days. So... You know, we've got to look at these markets where we can, where solar and energy and things can, and blockchain can make such a difference. And you, you know what, I've, you, you dropped another little bomb in there, which is I, I was struggling with, some, with on Sergey's show. Sergey, who's uh, going to be joined, you know, he's in the group now and he's going to be joining part of the conversation later. We were talking about the development path of other countries. And I, I, I started to say developing world and third world, but then I realized those terms don't sound right anymore. And I love that you just said emerging world. I, I, I'm going to switch my vocabulary to that. I like emerging world because that's kind of acknowledging emerging where markets. they're going. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. So Austin, we're going to switch to you, my good friend. Yeah, um, the Austin origin story. You know, there, there's Wolverine and there's Sabretooth. Oh, Sabretooth. man. I like yeah, him. He's, so, a, he's, a, he's a great actor. So go for it. Well, for, so oh, no, now no. you see why, now you see why I talk to Loretta almost every day now. We met, we met <laughs> only this year, but we are, we became fast friends and uh, she's halfway across the world, but we find a way to talk all the time. Amazing. We're doing a few things in stealth that we can't talk a lot about. Well, we can talk a little about some of those. And, and um, so me, my, what, what am I, who am I? How did I come to existence? Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, uh, I will skip past the uh, intertwining of DNA stage and I guess go to uh, my background where, where, is- Where are you from? 
I'm from North Carolina. So okay. that's, 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 that's my uh, home state. I spent two, the first two years of my life in Japan, actually, because uh, my, uh, my dad was IBM. So we, we decided to move over there. That was fun. I used to speak Japanese, but I lost it by now because don't keep it up. But um, mm -hmm. at any rate, my background is engineering. I have a couple of uh, degrees from NCSU, um, which somehow led me down to the path of Bitcoin because I'm, it's right after grad school, I escaped, uh, escaped NC to go to Los Angeles on a road trip, decided uh, that I was going to stay for a little longer because it was very interesting and complete opposite of uh, you know, conservative East Coast and a lot of startups and a lot of uh, what I love, which is, you know, building things from the ground up. Um, so I stayed and I stayed for 12 years and uh, would still be there. I But I escaped L.A. recently because of this this crazy year that we're in. But uh, I'll be yeah, back. And you left me so, behind. Yeah, thank exactly. You. Thank yeah, you. New Santa, Monica, really appreciate Santa Monica's that. home base. Santa Monica's yeah. home base. So, oh. you know, uh, you know, did a lot with startups over the years. I worked with Uber and Lyft in the early stages doing uh corporate partnerships because I had a lot of relationships with all the studios and big law firms and uh, corporate entities in uh, Los Angeles. So when, before anyone knew what Uber was, I was always showing up in a giant, because back then they only had black cars and you could get the giant, you know, black SUV for, you know, what at the same price, because that's just what it was. And that's all they had. Um, so people are like, what is this? Like, what are you, what are you doing? So anyways, that, that was a lot of fun back then um, working with startups like that. And then, you know, I was, founder of a few that were, uh, one was a competitor to TaskRabbit that got, uh, had a good exit. And, um, you know, that led me kind of closer and closer to, uh, to Bitcoin. I met somebody in Venice in 2012 that was mining Bitcoin at a party. They just had like a, a rig, one of those like box rigs on top of their uh, countertop and kind of got me interested in that. So uh, o over the years, um, you know, started getting deeper and deeper involved in blockchain technology, uh, started Blockchain Beach. Some people know me for that. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty uh, deep on the community side there. Um, and now really just very deep. I, in actually, I, I'm sorry, Aaron dropped in the chat. Aaron, he said 2012, did he, did he hear that right? For, I think for the, your, when you found the rig, was that 2012? Yes. Yeah, that was just at a oh, random gee. party. That was a random party when uh, somebody was uh, mining it. And I had heard of it because I was reading little articles about it, but I wasn't super engaged. But that was like what really got me fascinated to I mean, be able to pick someone's brain a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. um, so so at any rate, uh, that kind of led me down the path. And, and now now I really just um, I'm, I'm, I'm on the... Uh, operational side and I work with a lot of the folks here on, on uh, the call in different uh, organizations. I'm kind of like Loretta where I'm spread out over a, a bunch of different things and I could talk for days about that but the big one that ties in here and kind of one of the main ones that I'm a co-founder of is uh, community electricity so that ties in exactly to the topic here about decentralization of energy kind of creating the uh, prosumer networks where a producer can also be a consumer of energy and, and selling it to your neighbors and also extending that to the open markets and creating new types of assets that uh, can also have futures and be traded and, and provide a lot of benefits. Um, so like, for example, can, if you're- Can, can I jump in for a second? So yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm a complete noob when it comes to energy and power. It's just when you brought it up as a topic, I thought, wow, that's interesting. So yeah. there's, there's probably a bunch of uh, assumptions or or understandings or actions that someone more familiar with, with the space that it would have. So and we could understand the revolution that you're gonna be describing in more detail and how it differs from the status quo. But just for someone who's brand new, what, what is the status quo that, that you're disrupting? Like what, what was the world so, before? Yeah. So the status quo is creating all the blackouts and problems that we see in the energy grids today. It's, it's very centralized generation and distribution of energy, um, it's a nuclear power plant. It's a coal power plant. It's a it's a dam. It's some sort of centralized uh, generation of power that gets distributed out from one location, kind of like mm -hmm. you know storing all of your credit cards on one AWS server. Mm -hmm. If that server gets hacked, you know there's, there's an issue there. So, um, but it's it's different with energy because the transmission you lose a lot. You know, in kind of some of the worst cases, you're losing 30% of the energy just sending it from the centralized point to where it needs to go. Um, I mean, if you look, 
it's not hard to believe when you look at Venice and some of the parts, most of Los Angeles, we have third world power grids, you know, third world power lines, you know, you, you hear them buzzing when you, when you go by the, most of yeah. the rubberized coating has eroded off from the sun and the weather. Um, so it's, it's pretty third world, um, in a lot of places that, that, it, are, and, that and you would I, think I would be first world. What you say, yeah. is, is that, be, so is that buzzing because the covering is wearing away? Like I, I, I hear uh, that when well, I walk. It's, 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 it's interaction with, uh, part of its interaction with, um, humidity in the atmosphere. So if it's a mm. foggy day, you'll hear some of that. Some of it could be a connection uh, point that's, that's a little bit different. So it depends on what type of buzzing. But the one I remember very well from Venice, California is the one where, it, where it's really like kind of wet day or foggy day and you hear it, like it, it intensifies. So it's, it's correlated. So at any rate, um, the, the blackouts, the, uh, the fires, the, the utilities have admitted some of the fires were caused by the grids. So um, it's, it, it's a bigger issue um, that really it doesn't make any sense to produce energy so far away when we have, especially in California, right? Where places like California, where there's so many sunny days throughout the year, you can produce enough energy just on all the empty rooftops. Go to Google Sunroof. There's a the website called Google Sunroof and it'll show you, you know, how many kilowatt hours are on each sunroof. And it shows you the oh. capacity of each sunroof, the, each, each rooftop uh, of every building in, in Los Angeles and anywhere really. So um, it's, it's pretty fascinating to, uh, to really be able to do this because we've gotten a, a pretty significant grant from the California Energy Commission to build a pilot um, that is, you know, has a blockchain backbone essentially um, where everything's gonna be connected uh, and managed um, with nodes in each home and each car and very granular kind of sequestration of carbon along the way. So it's, it's really, really fascinating and really, really it's, it's the way forward. I mean, if you look at nature, that's how nature operates, right? They don't, they're not drawing from one central place you know it's it's even like your your, your molecules share um you know electrons and other atoms with each other like as as needed mm. you know chemical reactions even in your body it's it's just how nature operates and it's how we need to operate if we want to be successful especially with um all the doomsday predictions you know if we don't change something in the next 10 years like it, it's it's going to get worse and worse you know places like florida will keep having to build walls Singapore is already building a wall in certain time around the whole place, right? So they're they're already they're not denying anything. <laughs> they know right. it's coming, and we all know it's coming. We're all just kind of a lot of us want to ignore it, but I, I I don't think we can anymore. So producing energy locally and distributing it, and like like Laura said, peer to peer is is the way forward, and it's a really big way to solve some of these issues um, that are causing all kinds of disruption on the planet. So, so, so that's, let, that's, let me that's let me throw this to. To, to both of you, um, yeah, in, in any order, there's a. I'm trying to get a, away from the sun here. You're, I think you're okay. There now. we go. Yeah, just yeah. you know, rotate as the Earth rotates or something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to. Or when you see the sun in my window, you know you're okay. So yeah, there's some things that must achieve scale in order to operate efficient efficiently. You know, that's the nature of some things. Um, it's, it's hard for me, you know, and an air, I, like an aircraft carrier, it needs to be a certain size to have a, an effective component or contingent to it. Or maybe a nuclear power plant needs to operate at a certain size just to make it worthwhile. Is, is that a thing in energy or can it truly be sort of atomized down and then localized? Because before you answer, I, I understand the idea that there's a huge uh, loss or tax in transmitting it. And so locality is better than distance. But is there anything structural preventing that in terms of mass required to produce a good result? Well, you need microgrids, right? For for mm. neighborhoods and communities, you're going to need little hubs. So you know you you're going to need yeah you're going to need some localized kind of management uh, microgrids. Uh, but that's that's really the solution. You're not it's not completely just home to home. There are kind of centralized. Uh, microgrid that can help manage the entire. So, for example, what, what our, does that mean exactly? It sounds cool, but explain microgrid. So, it's really just a uh, instead of a very large generation plant uh, that distributes and manages the energy, it's a smaller version of that for the neighborhood, right? So, for example, in our pilot, which is 28,000 residents in, in Basset Avocado, which is basically East LA, that's, there's a neighborhood called Basset Avocado that. Uh, 
that is a disadvantaged community. And that's where we're operating environmentally disadvantaged communities in California to start. Um, and the, there's a church that kind of is going to be acting as that microgrid. So it's got the most kind of rooftop and capacity. And it's also got a lot of parking uh, coverage that's going to be uh, have, have solar on it and in EV chargers, but it's also a great way. People have to opt into this. We can't force them to do it, right? This is a choice. So it's a great way to also have people that are already kind of community members that can learn about it and opt into the program, especially if, you know, a local, you know, uh, place like that is doing it. So it's essentially um, microgrids are the way forward. And there's a lot of legislation that needs to be pushed for that because right now there's something called the over the fence rule, uh, which means you can't sell energy to more than two of your adjacent neighbors, I believe is what it is. Um, so it's- Why in God's name is that, that rule? Because utilities don't want too much competition. And yes. it's, in California, there's something called the Clean Power Alliance and the Community Choice Aggregation, which the utilities are mandated. There's a certain percentage that has to be produced by clean power. And so that's, that's what's really amazing is that, you know, the CPA can buy up this clean power from the homes. Um, and, and, and Loretta, let, let me let me pass it to you. Give, give us sort of your version of Energy 101 and where you see is the yes. good. But, so it's interesting. So, and, but I look at all these pockets of like yeah, decentralization, whether it be something like Bitcoin, money, or yeah, peer to peer electricity trading. There, there's fundamental issues with the way that centralized systems work. Um, they're legacy systems, they're controlled, they have a lot of middlemen, a lot of frictions in systems, which makes people a lot of money out of them. Um, and we've always had the middlemen in systems. So when you start to disintermediate any market, whether it be energy market, you know, financial markets, people get upset. So, so there's a lot of regulation as well that is very old school that you have to get through. And so all these new technologies, you know, it's what I do is write regulation. It's very hard sometimes um, to, to create the, these new systems because you get a lot of pushback because people don't like change. That's one of the things. I um, mean, in Australia, I got into this because a friend of mine is the premier of one of the states, South Australia. Now, they sold off all their grids to the neighbouring states. So for a period of you know, one or two days, they had more, more sunlight in the summer time than, you know, than was, was needed. But they would go for days without having electricity because the other states, other states could trade it. Um, and sometimes when you trade, you know, trade an asset, it can take, um, it can take one and between one and 27 days if you trade water to clear and settle this. Now, why is that? It's because the people that are, um, that are doing the clearing and settlement make money of holding assets. And that's what I found with financial markets is the same thing. Um, there's a lot of friction in systems and the processes and procedures post trade are very antiquated and very old and very expensive. Um, and what, that's wrong. But now, when we have now that we have blockchain and we have these technology, we can atomically swap assets for, to start with. But we can start to decentralise systems, which take away that centralised power and control, which is very archaic. Um, it's a, it's it's it doesn't work. And I really like the peer to peer energy because um, you know if this year showed us anything, Mother Nature's gone right. You guys, if you don't change your ways, I'm going to lock you all up in little cages and rooms forever. So mm -hmm. you know um, we. Have have no alternative than to use technology to save us. I think it was interesting, someone said to me the other day, the 20s, 20s is going to be the decade of survival for mankind. And I think that's really true. Um, but I think, you know, it becomes funky um, out of some of these systems now that we can, you know, that you're going to have trading of assets um, on mass, like just not from electricity. People can choose if they're going to have carbon emissions, which are going to be better for the, the you know, for the, um, for the environment. You know, fires are being caused all over the world. Australia was no different to California over Christmas. We lost a billion animals in the worst fires that we've ever seen in history. So climate change and these things are all coming together to show us, you know, burning fossil fuels and doing things the way we've done it is going to destroy the planet and it's going to destroy us. So we have to find these new ways and we have to use technology um, to take the burden, I guess, off, off the planet or otherwise we're not going to exist. So I think well, you've got a, a very funny time, I think, in history where um, technology technology has sort of come, to, come together with Mother Nature in a way and we're starting to build systems and solve problems um, because if we don't, we're all going to die. And we're not going to exist as a species in 10 years. The earth will go on, but I don't think we will. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that's where, that's where the decentralisation and the technology and the fundamental you know, libertarian business or what we talk about, we talk about Bitcoin, sort of all merges together 
and decentralizing power away from centralized institutions that just make money because they're a centralized institution and regulations say they can. Doesn't mean that it's right. So, but all that needs changing at the same time, and that's the challenge. Um, yeah, energy regulation is very hard to change. It's sort of like banking regulation. But I like a good challenge, and that's sort of what I'm now opting to look at is how I can change regulation to make, um, you know, make the technology fit into what we have as existing rules and regulations, which are not so good. And let, let me ask, is, is there something about peer-to-peer -peer or distributed energy services that lend themselves to renewables more than centralized? I mean, is, is there any reason why you wouldn't have a peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, gas-fired plants? Is there something unique? Like, does the nature of it change when you distribute it? Well, it's, it's really about local generation, right? You're not going to locally drill oil in your backyard, right? And or you're you not may gonna, have a generator in your backyard, hypothetically. Running off oil, yeah, but then you're still shipping the oil all over the world to get to your backyard. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not efficient. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the process of drilling the oil is also destructive. So I, I and oil is not gonna completely go away. We're just gonna stop burning it for moving things around or producing energy, right? For the most part. Um, and Marco had a good point. So another way to think of a microgrid is, is like a mesh network, right? Because right now microgrids are a little bit different, but in the future, kind of what we're, what we're building is this highly connected system where everything's producing and communicating and talking. Like even your car, you plug it in, should be feeding back to the grid when it needs it. Like think about how many millions mm -hmm. of batteries are in big cities right now and how much energy is that, you know, how many gigs potentially is that of energy that you that could be going back to the grid um so and and you think you could prevent a blackout with that probably um so it, it's and it's right, not actually, just actually, 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 we, would the concept of a blackout even apply if we truly went to mesh or would it just be highly localized no because everything moments? everything shifts everything is is very dynamic it'll shift mm -hmm. the load where it needs to go um and and there'll be there'll be emergency There'll be a, a, a market for that too, because people will be willing to pay to shift it, you know, where it needs to go. Um, whether it's, you know, utilities and people, or a combination of both, cities, municipalities. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be really interesting once it's alive to see how this happens. And then some of it will, um, I'm sure that you know, nonprofits and other, you know, white hat entities will emerge to really help, help do it without needing the upside, right? So I think there's going to be a uh, once everything's communicating and able to send energy the way that we can send information. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be really interesting. I'm just looking at the comments and yeah, here. And I think that's an interesting point because I think what we're seeing it now is like blockchain on its own one. It's not great, but if you're seeing there's, emergence, I guess, of these new technologies like AI, the internet of things and blockchain, when they all come together and they can, you know, we can have, cars talking to each other and grids talking to each other the systems become so much more dynamic and efficient um, and we've never had technology before to do this so this is why i think it's an exciting time because all these you know these emerging technologies are starting to come together and to mold into to morph into these really interesting you know, systems that that actually change you know social and economic outcomes of things really dynamically and, and that's what i find really exciting mm. Interesting. And, you know, I guess I'm old enough to remember Enron, and I think Enron was the beginning of energy trading. We're, we're, and, of course, that didn't end up well. So what, what, what happened there, and what did we learn from that? And is, is anything that we learned from that applicable to this brave new world of, of the 2020s? Well, I missed the question. Sorry, you brought, you, you brought uh, up the Enron. I think Enron was, oh, like, Enron. you know, was the, I, I think the premise of that was live trading energy markets, I believe. And of course, that did, didn't end up well. Maybe, maybe not because of the business model, but just because of their internal accounting. Is there anything so to be I mean, learned from that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to be learned from that. And there's a lot to be learned from the GFC, and that's what Bitcoin was born out of. The GFC, these systems, mm. you know, the, the 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 way that data, you know, um, now that we have secure, transparent data systems that are immutable and nobody can change, are very, very interesting. So these internal accounting systems, Enron's a good example. I mean. The global, the GFC happened for two reasons, because you had bankers selling, um, you know, 
mortgages in the southern parts of the US to people and then give you an extra $100,000 um, to go and buy themselves a fridge or a, a couch and reselling that in a hedge um, to hedge funds as AAA rated assets. And the whole mm. thing was built on smoke and mirrors. But with the blockchain, it, with the technology we have down the dumb bases, you can't do that. And I think that's important. And um, I don't think we've actually learned that much of a lesson from the GFC yet. And I think mm. that's if you're looking at the price of Bitcoin today, we're starting to see that because the baby boomers didn't learn a lot. And they're, they're inherently the ones that have held these assets. And people always bring this up to me, but it's the millennials that are the ones that understand technology and want change. And I can tell you with the stimulus packages you're getting out of the US and Australia of Papers, pieces of paper that are backed by nothing. Um, nobody's going to be paying off the tax and the debt of my little girl's generation or the generations after. So, the, so these these systems are breaking away from the traditional, um, you know, the traditional way we do things, and they're breaking the faults in the system. Because I think Enron was a big fault in the energy system, and I think the GFC was a fault in the financial, the global financial system. And now we're seeing these total you know, breakouts. Um, from these systems, and I think that's a really good thing. But did we learn lessons? I think people take a long time to learn lessons because they don't like change. But I think when we, the baby boomers who stop writing policy, um, let the millennials come up to be the baby boomers and have control of assets, yeah, we're going we're gonna to learn all those lessons that we haven't probably learned for the last 50 years across yeah, all sectors. And I also want to point out as a member of Gen X, I, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll count myself as a millennial for this conversation. Darn it. I was a baby boomer, I think. Was it? No, you, you look young and wonderful. You're, you're, you're Gen X. Let's just, let's just say we're all Gen X. Okay. So <laughs> interesting. Okay. And then also, you know, you, you, you sent over some sort of touch points b before this. <laughs> it is going to be a fantastically broad question, but we don't, we, we, you, you, a recurring theme in your speaking is the laws of thermodynamics. That, that seems to be like a philosophical point for you beyond a physics point. Can you kind of you know give us the little inner workings of your soul and your well, mind? Well, that's it's really that? simple. It doesn't it doesn't have to be a very complex explanation. I mean, those are kind of some of the fundamental laws that the universe follows, right? Everything mm -hmm. that exists follows, uh, you know, the laws of thermodynamics. So the first one that really applies here is the. Uh, conservation of energy right it can't be created or destroyed but it can be transformed in one form or the other you know like i was just saying in the comments you can you can do work um and put the time in through labor that turns into money right that's kind of like energetic money you can turn chemical energy into money by burning fuel and selling it you can there, there, there's there's all kinds of potential kinetic chemical all types of energy can be converted into things like money and other things so um the laws of thermodynamics is something that, uh, you know, I love that. Do, do you know who Jeremy Rifkin is? I know the uh, name, but I, I have to admit, I don't know any detail. I don't know what you're getting at, but I'm, I'll start Googling yeah. and tell me. <laughs> so he, he talks about it a lot too, but he's, he's like a economist that you know, works with um, kind of like Loretta works with uh, mm. heads of government to restructure and make sure that they're going to have a, a future. Um, I like how Mar Marco says there's no laws in physics anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so at any rate, um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's essentially why I bring it up because you can't escape them, but our systems have been designed to ignore them. You know, for example, uh, Facebook's profit engine, right? And, mm -hmm. and some of our big companies, like they consider profit for profit's sake alone without resources considered or anything else, right? And it's, it's causing all kinds of problems. And a lot of our economic theories are based on profit alone without resources considered. Um, and that fundamentally doesn't really consider the laws of thermodynamics. And it's great, you know, my background, like I said, is engineering. So I had to study it quite a bit in school, but I haven't necessarily been using it um, other than in principle, right? From from kind of a philosophical standpoint, but it's great to see it emerging because it ties in directly to Bitcoin and everything else. Like Bitcoin is one of the first types of, you know, money, if you will, or store of value that actually fundamentally follows the laws of thermodynamics very well. Um, and, you know, by, by design. So like, our, our money is, is kind of bleeding energy, right? Like our fiat money is, is leaking energy. Mm -hmm. That's why they have like websites like Fiat Leak. <laughs> it's leaking it in all kinds of ways. We are Go ahead. One, hey, 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 that, that feels true, but how do you mean exactly? Well, we're printing it. The supply is increasing. Yeah, so so you're, purchasing, you're purchasing power is decreasing uh, faster than 
you know, your profits are probably increasing enough to, to stabilize that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's leaking out of fiat into things like Bitcoin. It's leaking in many ways. Um, but it's, it's just, it's, it's designed, uh, it's a flawed design, right. Um, to say that, that we're just going to print unlimited money is, is great for the short term, but long run, it doesn't, it doesn't stabilize the dollar. Right. Um, so, um, yeah. So that, that's what I mean by, by it's leaking, you know, the increasing supply and other factors that are, uh, causing it to, to bleed energy. Right. So that, that's, that's yeah. essentially what I mean there. Yeah. And, and Loretta, I think you were commenting. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that's the thing, you know, we're, like, um, you know, the US dollar is actually backed by nothing anymore and we're printing more of it. So we're printing more of something that's not backed by anything and it, yeah, it's causing all sorts of problems around the world. And I, and, and I think Bitcoin with the whole libertarian um, aspect, just decentralization is really is fundamentally changing the way we are in the world. I mean, this year in itself has changed everything, how we work, um, how we interact with each other. You know, as I said, uh, yeah, it's... Um, I had a really interesting podcast and I was I was doing it the other day. I, when I think with what Bitcoin's doing at the moment, it is, it's the democratisation of money. Now, money means different things to many people. Mm. Money can comes out of barter. Um, but I think, you know, at, 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 at the rate that, that we're seeing the, these... These systems, which actually rely on the mathematics that one plus one equals two, not of a network of people decide they're going to change the rules just because they want to, is very fundamentally different from how the world has always worked because people could change the rules when they wanted. But these new systems of decentralization, yeah, they believe in the laws of mathematics, not in the laws of what people believe or human human behavior. And it's interesting, I'm, I'm watching the demise now of monetary and for fiscal policy. Um, yeah, and, and that's a very hard thing to explain to traditional bankers. Why is Bitcoin now sitting at whatever it is, $18,000? It's because you've seen a fundamental shift. Yes, no asset class goes one way forever. And that's, you know, that's the laws of physics. Well, what goes up does come down. But, um, you know, the, the mainstream, I guess, of decentralisation wasn't around three or four years ago when I was talking to central banks and regulators. I um, mean, you know, they may as well told me that I was a mad idiot and to go away and I didn't know what I was talking about and there was no way that these things would start to, um, you know, George Orwell might have been correct before I was, but I think those things happened. And this year, you know, three years ago, would we have thought that blockchain solutions, whether it be around you know, energy, um, you know, democratising energy or money, existed? No, we wouldn't have. And we wouldn't have seen these systems um, take off like they have. But you know, we're sitting at the end of 2020 and the world is a very different place than it was at the end of 2019, 2019. Mm -hmm. Very. <laughs> I'm feeling it myself. Though, hey, I, I got to throw this out here. What the heck is a virtual power plant? So it's, it's essentially the, the kind of same thing as a big power plant, but instead it's kind of like the microgrid conversation we had earlier virtual power plant is essentially everything that's connected that acts the same as a power plant would by managing the transmission and location and generation of energy uh, but instead of from one place out to a bunch of other places it's a bunch of other places connected transacting all the time to each other um, and yeah so that that's essentially a virtual power plant uh, it's mm -hmm. it's pretty 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 uh pretty amazing because they they actually work really well as long as they're designed and um you know as long as they're communicating properly right as long as they're as long as you're sending energy where it needs to go when it needs to be there it works really well Sounds just like a, like a mesh network works it works in your home yeah interesting uh so aaron asked a good question in the chat i, I don't think you can say it out loud just because of where he is right now but i'll, I'll try to read it correctly he said uh, so would you have the data saying how much energy flows where on a blockchain sure but as i understand the mesh network is a multiple multiple strings coming together in many different nodes so purely technical how would a two-dimension blockchain describe a three-dimension network except maybe if you have huge computer computational power behind it talking quantum computers i'm not sure i quite understand what he meant no the boss and i feel I like don't, you, I really think, you, know, you would you don't. You don't need quantum computing necessarily. I mean, uh, if you're trying to create, sorry, what, what, what does that what question mean? For. Uh, he's just saying, how does a a two D you know blockchain translate a three D world and all the devices and everything else that's connecting and communicating? But mm. but I like Marco's answer. I'll just read it. The mesh has outputs and inputs to and from nodes, easy to implement on blockchain. 
So essentially it's um, all of the nodes that are in each, each home, each car, each device, you know, already are, are they're, they're data points that communicate, right? Whether it's data or transactional or anything else. Um, so it, it's, it's really about the, the network doesn't care about the 3D world. It cares about device I identities and mm. who's talking to what. You know, again, the fridge, you, you guys might remember this from the DAO conversation the other day. The mm -hmm. fridge can be an entity. It might be able to participate in a DAO in the future. Um, and it will, it, they already are communicating, right? To Amazon without you. I'm going to go ahead and reorder your almond milk because you're out of it. Um, yep. Because you told me I could. So now I have my own proxy via you. So <laughs> uh, you know, even if you didn't tell it, soon we'll order the almond milk. So, right. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and eventually, you know, all of your devices will communicate the same way, permissioned, right? That as long as you're giving them permission. Mm -hmm. um, now, I guess that the whole AI conversation will be interesting, right? Because if you look at the whole conversation before about profit, the profit, you know, beast that we've created, um, yeah, I think we'll start to see that pan out in devices too, eventually, if, if they're learning from the systems that we've designed before. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how we have to kind of course correct some of that. Um, but most of those are, are in walled gardens anyway, like Facebook's algorithms aren't public, right? So it's not like they're leaking into everything else, like your fridge, um, hopefully. <laughs> Isn't there like, but we're seeing more and more open source AI. And yeah, yeah, that's true. That, that's why Elon Musk, you know, wants to, has created that kind of uh, the demon the, for good open source yeah. AI to to combat to combat the uh, the evil. Just in case some some evil entity gains too much power, there's this, you know, there's a a front running, you know, uh, like again, we're we're hedging our bet there. Hopefully, hopefully, our good AI will be strong enough to compete with the bad AI if it ever comes about. Yeah. And I think that's, that's an interesting one too, because like we, I have this discussion a lot about AI. I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's, there's no emotion. And that's one thing we will always have as humans is to, to, to have emotion, love and hate. But I use a good example is dementia. A person that's dementia, mm. you, can't, you can't figure out what their next move is. So an AI algorithm doesn't really know what someone with dementia is ever going to do because they can't, because it, it's so unplanned. Um, but you know, these systems are, are getting interesting and there's going to be a lot of ethical questions around them and you know, how they interact with us as well. Interesting. Now, look, Which look, is another question. Let me ask you, 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 you seem, you, you've, you've worked with regulators in Australia and I'll call it the developed world, world, world for lack of a better term, but you're also heavily involved in the emerging world. And the emerging world, from what I think I'm hearing, seems to be more receptive to this message than the developed world. Is that merely because they have less sort of uh, incumbent systems that they need to worry about? Or is there something more than that? So I think there's a couple of factors. So, so I lived in India for 10 years. So I took, a, I took my little girl when she was six months old as a single mother to live in India trying to back. Uh -huh. Don't know if I'd do that again. Um, and, it, and it was an interesting experience to me because in India, I'll use an example, like no one would ever answer me on an email. It's most frustrating. Every Indian government official, you'd send 50,000 emails, no one would answer you. The minute, so, and the reason was because India didn't have, lap, didn't have um, computers on their desks. There was one, one, one computer for a lot of people. So India leapfrogged. She missed the laptop. She missed that and she went straight to smartphones. And she went straight to WhatsApp. So you can even send the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi, a WhatsApp and he'll answer you. But heaven forbid, nobody will ever send you an email. So that these emerging markets leapfrog and they leapfrog out of necessity. And if you look at, um, you also look at these, their populations, they're very young. And I think the internet and the smartphone has huge penetrations in the emerging world. Like if you look at the smartphone penetration in Africa and India alone, um, yeah, it's, it's, and even on a 2G network in somewhere like Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea at least somebody in a family has access to this device. Now, what has that done? It's democratized education. The internet democratized our access to media. So there's a lot, there's a lot more, um, I guess it's not an entitlement now to be educated. You can educate yourself if you have an internet access and a smartphone. Um, so they, they leapfrog a lot. And if you look at the M-Pesa in Kenya, it's one of my best examples because the, the minister who built it has become quite a good friend of mine. The M-Pesa was created as a mobile money because people didn't have bank accounts. There were no banks. So the telecoms had to take on the role of the banks. So 
the emerging world is very adaptable. It moves very quickly, and it, and the legacy systems that we have to deal with, um, you know, even in Australia and Canada and the US, you've got in the US hundreds of regulators, and then you've got different regulations across states, and then you look at Europe, and you've got you know different countries across miles. It's a big jar of spaghetti. But I write regulations and laws around the Commonwealth because what's the one thing that the Commonwealth's got? That's 53 countries and members. We've got common law, British law system. Thank you to the British. They didn't give us all much else, but they gave us the same law system. So it's been easy for me to write one set of regulations, not purpose fit them into another country, but to give like an entire legal framework around blockchain and the regulations that we need for these technologies to now 53 countries. Whereas if I tried to do this in the US, it'll take me you know, the next 50 years and it's a law system I don't understand. Europe's very complica you know, complicated because you've got a big jar of spaghetti. You've got so many countries and so many regulators. So the Commonwealth for me has been easy because if you look at the emerging world, a lot of, a lot of Africa is the part of the Commonwealth. India is part of the Commonwealth. Um, a lot of these countries have British law systems and these legacy systems, if they're all the same, are much easier to, to, to write to change much faster than if I've got to go through a different state or a different regulator across 52 states. So, yeah, I think the emerging world moves faster for the reasons that technology um, is, is very accessible now. The smartphone has made an incredible penetration difference. You have less legacy systems and they leapfrog. And you have younger populations. So if you look at Africa and India, these are the youngest populations in the world and Latin America, of course. Kids adopt technology faster than the people that are sitting, you know, in in parliaments writing policy at seventy you know, years of age in in some of the emerging world and some of the, the what we call the mature world. And, and does this demographic specifically play into energy beyond blockchain, beyond yeah. communications? Yeah, I mean, I think it does. I mean, like as I said, you look at places like Nigeria, you look at Kenya, you look at Botswana, Mauritius, where you've got typically still quite rural environments where there's not big grids, so they have problems. So if you can you can start to standardise small communities and villages, um, Papua New Guinea is a good example. We did this when a micro grid in Papua New Guinea. Um, so so places that that are highly ruralised, I guess, they're not so much more concentrated with you know, large cities. Um, I think these these systems take off a lot quicker because they're much easier to implement and they're not as expensive. So you know, the systems right. we have are very expensive in the mature world, and you've got to spend you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to put new grids in. But if you can do it at a at a local level in a lot of the emerging world, it's much cheaper because you have a lot of costs that are cheaper. But um, the and same with things. same with water too, and things like that, yeah. right? Like clean water. Like look <laughs> at the water.org project. I think Matt Damon and there's mm -hmm. obviously there's a big group. He's he's one of the investors and figureheads, but but they, they're doing sixty dollar micro loans, and they've it's it's extremely successful where the loans are pay, like ninety nine percent plus paid back because they're six dollar a month payments, and these farmers or whoever small shop owners um, in emerging world are able to make those payments, um, whether they're making them or paying them with new loans, because I would imagine with these loans, they're able to extend it to multiple people in the household. So I think it's a, it's an interesting system, but it's, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's less expensive and it's a very low infrastructure level solution that provides clean water to every single home. So, so yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting. And the same, same can be applied to a very small, I mean, energy is a little bit different, but it's still like you could have a low footprint you know, energy solution because they're not they're not using energy like we are, right? They're not running yeah. their, their fridge and their their washer. They're, they're running a light bulb and they're probably charging their phone. You know, exactly. Right, right, right. Uh, and 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 they're using gas probably to cook it, right? Oh, by the way, I want I want to notice behind me that the sun has broken through the window, and <laughs> yes, yes. So we, 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 we have proof of Studio City. <laughs> Those are some good uh, LED screens you've got glued to the window there. Uh, You're smart. Darn it, darn it, you, saw, you saw through me. Wait till you see the yeah. animated lizard crawl by. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, Marco. Marco has the iguanas. Mar Marco's like in, in heaven. So let, let me, we're, we're kind of getting out of it. Let me let me throw something at both of you. And uh, Austin, maybe you can talk about community electricity more as part of this answer. So fast forward to 2035. And Imagine that what you're working for and what you're striving for is in place 
and is working the way you wanted it to, or the way you want it to. Let me, you know, this is like a subjunctive future past tense kind of thing. You know, give me a verbal portrait of what 2035 looks like if you win. And I'll, I'll start with Austin and then we'll go to Loretta. Um, so it's interesting you chose 2035 because that's the year that no more gas cars will be sold in California. Hmm. I don't, I don't know if you saw that. Uh, Newsom announced that a couple weeks ago or probably three weeks ago or a month ago at this point. But um, yeah, so after 2035. Was, was that when he was at the Flint, French Laundry having food with a whole bunch of people without a mask? Was that most one? likely, most okay, likely, fantastic. yes. My God. Yeah. 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 Well, go on, please. <laughs> but yeah, so at, at any rate, who cares who said it? But it's 2035 for California. 2030 in the UK is what Marco just said. Um, 2026, Volkswagen will not produce any more uh, gas combustion powertrains. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's looking like the way and the rate things are going. I don't think the entire city of Los Angeles will be running, you know, in this peer to peer way because it's just too soon. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think a large percentage will be starting to consider it, especially the disadvantaged communities that we're focused on because they're the worst affected, right? So it's about 60% of, of California is disadvantaged and a similar level of Los Angeles, uh, meaning their, their pollution levels are so high. There's a Cal Enviro score and they're so high, like 70% and above or you know, 70 and above that, that living there for 10 years is, is exposing you to kind of stage four cancer conditions and people don't realize it, but it's, 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 it's the pollution, it's the car traffic, it's everything. It's the local buildings. It's, it's just the density of the population, really, um, and the energy production and the uh, burning of all the fossil fuels going in and out of the city. Um, so that that makes me think that I think by 2035, which is what, 15 years from now, I think we will have a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer systems in place. I don't think it will be a majority of the city at that point, but I do think we'll have a lot. I think we'll see a lot more um, EV share type uh, services where a lot of it's delivery too. Think about the way that things are going right now. A lot of people are going to continue that way. A lot of companies aren't going to go back to work. A lot of a lot of people will be virtual. A lot of mm -hmm. you know these types of panels won't happen in person anymore. Um, and and I don't. It's not going to be fear. It's going to be efficiency, right? Um, so a lot of people that used to host conferences. Well, well, let, let, let me jump yeah. one second. I'll, I'll pass it back to you. I, you know, I'm, yeah. my, when I grew up, I was always a fan of alternative history and that sort of niche of science fiction. And there's always, if you look at alternative history, there's always, you know, the standard timeline. There's always the point of departure, like a specific date where things go differently than they did in the real world. And you, you can always yeah. kind of argue that, you know, we're in some alternative history where, you know, in our history is weird. The Allies actually won World War II. Can you mention that? <laughs> you know, crazy times. So the, right. I, would, the, 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 I swear to God, it's 2020 feels like we're off the main time stream. Like something happened with COVID and everything else. It's, just, it's two things. It's, I think COVID especially, but it's several other things, accelerated the future. Like the future's arriving sooner than it would have. Because it's forcing digitization. I mean, we would. I, I think crypto and blockchain are blooming, and the dollar is having the issues much sooner. Not much sooner, but a few years sooner than it would have. And it's sooner. The future's here sooner, and it's a different future. I feel like we teetered off the main course, and now this is our life. And yeah, I mean, your point's well taken. I, you know, in person is nice, but this, we're, this COVID's been going on for so long. We're all kind of acclimated to the Zoom world now. And I don't know if right. I want to go back to it, you know, and there, there is, it's going to sound funny, but actually, I don't necessarily mind wearing a mask. You know, there's all this political, this, that about it. It's like with all this facial recognition tech, all these people, you know, getting into your business, you know, maybe, yeah. you, want, maybe you want a mask up. You know, it's like, you know, yeah, now you, have, now you have an excuse to wear it. <laughs> yeah. You know, otherwise it's like, <laughs> otherwise it's a potential crime in California. But I, I'm, well, I, it's I, funny, I, in, in, the, in the Western world, we always used to make fun of people that wore masks. Yeah. You see them at the airport, you see them around, you're like, oh, look at those weirdos. Like, why did they do that? Because mm -hmm. they've been going through this same thing that we're going through now for a long time. Yeah. Right? And, look, and, and look how well they're doing compared to us or us. You know, I'm, I'm being very LA centric. But yeah. So, so finish yeah, I mean, your, and, I'm going to pass it to Loretta in a second, but finish your 2035 vision. If everything works, it looks like X. 
Like, give me the blue if everything, like opening. If everything time. works, it, it's it's we've had a dramatic impact on the you know carbon footprint of cities and people and and how that we're how we're producing energy. I think if we're able to do it with the cars and the homes at first, I think it'll it'll go a long way. But I think people will start to wake up and realize just like they're starting to wake up and realize they can make money in other ways. They're going to realize they can make money off their home or their car, or maybe even walking. You know, the, if they're walking, your app is tracking just instead of just tracking your steps to make you feel good and compete with other people, you might actually be because of the granular sequestration of carbon throughout the year, you might have earned yourself a new iPhone. Right. Um, and I think companies like like big companies will part, start to partake in programs like that because they already have green bonds and other things in place to support initiatives. So I think we're going to see we're going to see people really waking up and stop denying climate and um, and uh, being forced to take action. And or, or and the way you do that is provide financial incentives. I'm a big believer in that. You know, that's why people first started to fall in love with Bitcoin. Right. It was, well, and, it was, and, there was and, a financial and I think the consequences of global warming which we're beginning to see the edge of now will have arrived, not in full force, but they will be noticeable in non-deniable oh, they, they ways. Will be. There, there's, yeah, another another thing that Rifkin always likes to, to point out, every one, one degree of temperature rise, there's 7% more water in the atmosphere, which means a lot more hurricanes on places like the East Coast and a lot more fire and drought on places like the West Coast. And those weather patterns you know, are similar throughout the world. So this year is there's a tremendous number of hurricanes um that keep bombarding i think some of you marco is going through it i've seen a few over here on the east coast and um it's uh it's getting worse for sure noticeably and the weather weather pattern weather patterns are changing but i think we'll just see it start to that'll get more dramatic and if it keeps getting worse you know in uh 30 30 to 40 years you know the it's going to be the equator is going to almost the weather in southern the southern states is almost going to be like living on the equator, but hotter. You know, it's going to it's, it's going to be like going up and up and up. It's going to get pretty intense. So if that happens, and if we some of it's out of our control, some of it we can maybe try to regulate by living more green and, and uh, you know having having these systems in place. But um, if that happens, we're going to see more exodus and more moving. Right? You're already seeing an exodus right now from big cities wow. because of just the nature of, of what's going on. I think we'll start to see an exodus uh, from this. In this, considering the states, the southeast and the southwest, because it's going to be too hot and too underwater, so people are going to start going into this V pattern and going up. Um, Canada's <laughs> looking pretty good. Some some Canadians in the call here. Hey, but, I, I, um, I, I, yeah, I, I want my Alaskan fortress assaulted. Now, let me pause you for a second. Let me, let me pass it to yeah, Loretta. That, that's it for me. I think I think I think we're going to see a lot of changes by then. But I think it's uh, hopefully we'll see a lot of good changes too. Got it. So Loretta, let me let me kind of reframe for you, and then I, I'm going to let you riff. So. Your, your worldview in 2035, if you are successful in everything that you're pushing when it comes to energy, well, especially energy, you know, obviously blockchain, crypto in general, but energy, energy, energy specifically, and for you, answer this if you can from sort of an emerging world lens. And um, I'm, I'm I, handing it to you. So I think, as I said to you, we have to survive. The 2020s is going to be the decade of survival. And if we don't do stuff differently, we're not going to be around for, nine, for, the, for the 30s. Um, by 35, I think work-life balance has changed. I think um, the way that we do things a year ago is we're not doing them now. And I think um, the, a lot of the problems we've had with the planet and electricity and we're busy and we're cities and we're wasting food and we're running around has got to do with this very busy life that we've all... We've all um, started doing and and when we stopped we were like well why were we so busy what were we actually doing for 20 hours out of 24 um and i think the um i think the work-life balance is going to really change everybody working from home is certainly going to have a better effect on the planet um i know i mean i used to travel around the world you know every three days i'd be on a plane i haven't been anywhere for you know, almost a year um so i i, I think the impact of um this covid is not going to go away pandemics are not going to go away and people are not going to um, what's the word? Um, to to greedily consume everything we have on the planet the way that we are at the moment, and so I think there's going to be much more balance in the way that we we deal with Mother Nature, we deal with energy, we we'll deal with each other. I think um, this has been a really a big wake up call. Um, and technology, you know, if anybody said that none of us the entire world couldn't work from home. Um, mm -hmm. 
six months ago, well, they obviously got that wrong. And yeah, this is the new norm. And I think it's better for the world. I think it's the, the only problem I think we're going to have is that we still need to have human contact. And, you know, I haven't seen my daughter for a year. That's ridiculous. Mm. So I think we have to have some sort of balance. Um, and, but if, if everything goes the way that I hope in energy, I would hope that every child has electricity, um, can have clean water and be fed in the emerging world because they're, they're, they're everyday problems that um, non-democratisation of any assets causes. And, and you don't notice it in the, in the mature world, but these are, these are everyday problems of, of kids in the emerging world. So now, if technology and what we all do and we can all work together to collaborate, because I, I believe that collaboration is the new survival, then we have a, we have a chance to have um, a better planet, a better a better balance of who we are as as a as species going forward for the next decade so, for the next decades. No, let, let me drill on that. Though. So, from your view specifically, what does success look like in twenty thirty five? Like is you know, there, pay, 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 me, pay me a picture. If you can. That every person can be sitting in their house, whether they be rich, poor, or in between, and make money from the, the services that they can provide, or selling their electricity to their neighbour, or selling, um, having a company with it's got drone space, so having a drone deliver a box. Mm. So everybody can make money out of new systems instead of giving it to a third party, which we're doing at the moment, that are making money off selling our data to other people. Out of these new systems we're creating, we can create new business models and new ways that we can facilitate profit and wealth for individuals in the emerging world, not so much the big corporations that are sitting in New York, London and, and Moscow. Beautiful. Okay. And this is the part of the show where we open it up to the esteemed peanut gallery. But you know it's been <laughs> it's been it's been it's been fascinating. And you know, I may have gone inside the over with my time, but it, this is a very it's a very energetic conversation. Ha. Huh. Sorry, I had to do that. Uh, we're we're going to lead off with our number one speaker, guest, and almost collaborator. I'd say, Marco, you know, are you going to show us your shirtless? Are you going to show us the shirtless Caymans thing? I think you are. Oh. All right. There it is. Oh, there you go. Looking good there, buddy. Looking, looking good. All right. Very sharp. You are all, all right. Mar Mar Marco, welcome as always. We really appreciate your. You know, it's not, even it's not even dedication, like collaboration. You, you, you know, Mar Marco's an alumni speaker. He formed a great panel on self-sovereign digital identity. He's obviously, you can tell from the chat and just his dialogue in general, he's super sharp, super plugged in. Yeah. Marco, take it away. Austin, I had no idea you were this deep into energy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you and I need to chat. Um, I'm actually working with a group in Berkeley uh, <clears throat> who have a Rocky Mountain working, Institute. No, Brillo and Energy. Okay. Um, that's uh, Brillo is the name of a French physicist who discovered Brillo spaces, which is something that helps you overcome the Coulomb barrier in yeah. fusion reactions. Okay. Um, in this case, uh, they don't do fusion. What they've done is they've figured out a way to turn hydrogen into neutrons. Ah, that's, in, that's fascinating. Uh, which in turn, naturally, with no, no help whatsoever from anything other than the fact that those neutrons exist, slowly uh, turns hydrogen, other hydrogen uh, in, this, in the system into helium over time. Uh, it's a four stage process. Add a neutron, hmm. add a neutron, add a neutron, big decay, right? Um, wow. So it's not fusion. People called it cold fusion for a while, uh, but it isn't. The real, the what, real kicker. It's what people referred to as cold fusion. Uh, yeah, it's what. It, well, it's what Fleischmann and Pons accidentally stumbled upon. But let's remember, those guys aren't physicists. They're they were chemists. Yeah. <laughs> they just made it by accident. Um, yeah. Anyway. These guys have got a working work out. They've had a working prototype for five years now. Uh, they've been refining it. Uh, they now get, and this sounds like nothing to people, but it, it's mind blowing when you actually understand the theories of thermodynamics that are currently out there. Uh, they put in a, a, a thousand watts of electricity. They get out 1200 watts of heat. Wow. Yeah. Uh, if you put a thousand watts of electricity into a regular heater, you get about 900 watts of heat out. Marco, can this operate There's always on a small loss. scale? Can this, this operate at a small house? That's the problem. 
That's the problem. The current reactors yeah. are all about one foot long, uh, maybe four inches in diameter, and that's just because they're lab units. This thing can go down to small enough to fit inside a cell phone if you get the miniaturization done and the heat dissipation happens because uh, we can get into uh, those issues at a later date. But uh, hmm. these reactors scale down or up. You can go up to megawatt plants, no problem. Zero emissions, zero radiation. Uh, they run on water, basically, because they generate enough uh, electricity. They will generate enough electricity when they get to 5x. They're currently at 1.2x. Um, when they get to 5x, they generate enough electricity to self-sustain and do the electrolysis necessary to feed the reactor the hydrogen it needs. And plain Jane electrolysis is all it needs. It sips hydrogen. Very, very small wow. amounts. Um uh, so and the big the barrier they're facing is that people's is water. No, the byproduct is helium and heat. Oh, okay. That's right. You said that. Before. And oxygen. Okay. If you factor in, if you factor in the electrolysis, the oxygen gets wasted as well. Um, but the, the, the point is, is that this is a technology that if they had funding at one, one hundredth, the one, one thousandth of the level that the fusion reactors are getting, we would have these in Home Depot. Right. Right. You, you'd, go, you'd go pick up a, a unit the size of a water heater using the current estimations of sizing required. The size of a water heater would power your entire home and charge your electric car. Wow. And you just feed it water. And Yeah, you, about, about, a, about a cup of water every couple of years. <laughs> so there's a lot of hydrogen in water. I, I, I think you guys yeah, need to have is. a conversation. <laughs> Anything. Yeah, that's... but that but that's that's an individual power solution that doesn't require any environmental other than some clean water every couple of years to keep the tank full. Right. The, the problem with that is, is that because it's a you buy it and then every five to seven years, you got to swap out the catalyst. Um, so this is basically the Iron the... Man. This is the Iron Man uh, plasma reactor that goes in his chest. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, sort of. Yeah, I mean, he was hinting at it in, in right. I mean, this is all fiction, right? Well, his, but they, they're hinting like at a, it with the palladium like ring. Thing, yeah. Uh, but uh, fundamentally, uh, it's, it's, it's the real thing. Uh, um, and it doesn't require palladium or platinum either, which is a, also a nice little thing on the cost side. They worked out that uh, right, with yeah. current manufacturing technology, you'd, you'd probably have to spend about 25k to buy one of these things, and then spend another uh two to three k every five to seven years to re to replace the catalyst rods which by the way are recyclable <laughs> which it sounds and, pretty affordable right off the gate for well uh, yeah and that's the thing right but they can't manufacture them yet because right so because they, they they can't get anyone interested in actually funding the conversion from lab to commercial hmm well, let's talk. I wonder why. Well, uh, uh, so, uh, I want to hear Loretta. Go ahead. Yeah, I said there has to be a reason. I'm going to put my um, venture right. capital competition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's got to be a reason is that they can't, if it's something that great, it gets funded. So I'm, that's, this is my banker hat going back on, not my other hat. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I mean, fundamentally. Pick, pick, pick up that challenge because there was a challenge thrown in. Well, OK. To me. So if you're an, if you're an investor, Right. You're an investor and you want to get into clean energy. Right. And you can go wind and solar and those are all very safe. And there's lots of scientists who will back it up and everything else. You walk into the, the, this, this lab and the only scientists who will back it are scientists who are talking off the record. Because in academia, especially in Europe and, uh, and even worse in the U.S., if a, if a professor with any qualifications in physics publishes anything about low energy nuclear reactions, he loses tenure. That, that, that sounds like an overstatement. Loses tenure? Loses tenure. You go ask MIT. You go ask uh, Stanford the, if they'll the, allow uh, their professors to comment I'll or even research. It'll be interesting on the, the ROI because I'm, I'm saying there's going to be a, a question, like an answer. So I was, ROI on this I was just I was just on with uh, NREL yesterday, 
So I bet you they would be interested. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and mm -hmm. they work pretty closely with the DOE. Um, I, I mean, I, I think they'd be interested. I mean, it's a lab. Well, the DOE is funny. I mean, I would welcome your your assistance in that one, definitely. But uh, the DOE is aware of this technology. Um, they're they're just mum on it. The problem with this technology is is that it's too cheap. Mm. Uh, you know, net net, and it it is it leans itself towards mesh grids rather than the traditional utility grids. Yeah. Right. So it sounds perfect for our project. <laughs> we should talk. Yeah. Well, exactly. And in fact, the blockchain implementation within the software of the reactor was already is already on the on the books in the roadmap because they wanted to have a way to uh, reliably track the performance of the unit and what was done with the energy. And one of the really killer things here is, is for the tropics, right? Hurricanes no longer matter. These things are pretty much indestructible, uh, except for the fact that they could get swept away if you don't fix them to the ground well. Um, yeah. But they generate electricity once they're at uh, production grade. They generate electricity, but they also have waste heat. And waste heat, I, this was something that blew my mind when I learned about it about a year ago. Something called absorption chilling where you use heat to air condition a place. And there's a lot of waste heat off of these things because as you probably know, uh, steam turbines are only 20% efficient. Mm -hmm. And some of the new technologies, the solid state thermo thermoelectric systems are only about 25% efficient. So you've got 75% of the heat or 80% or of the heat that you're using to generate electricity is wasted. Marco, let me right? pause you a second because this sounds well, like a, this sounds like you can use that like to make. Well, yeah, but you can use right. that to make elect, make air conditioning, <laughs> and, 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 which is kind of cool. Yep. Yep. Interesting. All right, so you guys connect. You're both in the alumni chat, Loretta. I'm gonna add you to the alumni chat also, if I may, on Telegram. And <laughs> uh, Torben, and actually Mark. Are you guys presentable? If you, if you are, uh, so, and, and, oh, we got another, Gordon Dixon showed up, awesome. And Aaron, if you're, well, you know, presentable, but you know, Mark goes with his shirt off. So everyone, everyone kind of okay. like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's all relative. Uh, so first one to unmute <laughs> gets to speak, but just announce yourself. Gordon, Aaron, uh, Torben. Gordon Dixon. Hey, Gordon. Oh, can I see your face? Um, Gordon, I think, other Gordon, I think you're Hello. muted and on. Welcome, Gordon. Hello. Welcome. Hello, Gordon. Hey, hey Torben you? also. Uh, okay, sorry, my, my Zoom is flipping around. You know, I, I'm going to go to Gordon first because I, I like your, because you have a good first name. <laughs> so, welcome. Uh, would you like to address a question or a comment to the, our esteemed panelists and welcome to the show? I've been here listening to it. It sounds great. Well, there you go. I, I like it. What's up, Gordon? Good to see you here. I've been on for the whole, almost the whole time. I was just uh, nice. Gordon actually, Gordon introduced me to Loretta. He's been talking about yes. her for years, and finally he put us <laughs> together this year. The Man. super connector. Low Joe's the best. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, welcome. And then, uh, Corbin, you, you put an interesting comment in the chat. Um, let's see here. here da, da, da. I'm, I'm scrolling up. About the draft? Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit? Just introduce yeah. yourself also. Yeah. Uh, first of all, no, hi, Loretta. <laughs> She's We're the all most friends. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I get it. So I, I'm, sure the, I'm sure the newbie. Meeting all these people. <laughs> hey guys, well, uh, welcome to my show. No, uh, nice to meet you. Tell us, tell us about yourselves first, and then yeah, um, we are based in um, in Germany, all over, kind of. Um, our uh, office is in Frankfurt, uh, but actually now we are sitting um, in Munich, mm -hmm. and uh, we are working in uh, in, uh, in the investment industry. Um, I'm a former investment banker, and I was uh, we had a, I had a quite a background in real estate infrastructure. And uh, two years ago, uh, I started Monument, uh, where we are developing real estate and infrastructure projects 
Mm -hmm. And um, we are at the moment focusing on uh, working with a lot of data in real estate. But uh, two years ago, we uh, had a joint venture with with uh, with a gov uh, with uh, um, a nonprofit organization here in uh, Germany, um, and also a water filtration producer. And um, we had a, a close look at um, the African. Um, to build a plant in Africa and uh, therefore we were starting doing some benchmarking and realizing there is a lot of data, really good data, but there's nearly to no um, player who is analyzing uh, like where to build the right plant, especially on an investment perspective. Um, so we did kind of a draft um, of how we would tackle the issue and um, yeah and now due to corona uh, we paused both projects the whole data thingy and also um, building up the project development but you guys these are the brothers they need, you need to speak to gordon gordon day and to austin as another i'll connect you this is the other thing we all do. <laughs> yeah, of course. They, uh, this, this thing's half networking. So the, what's the name of your venture or the name of your project? Um, oh, it's company. called, it's a monument gruppe. Um, monument gruppe. Okay, the okay. project, we actually, we don't have a name for the project as it's really a draft and was, and we wanted to use it for our purposes to have a, a to not, somehow uh, distributed or not in the early stage. Uh, we have always this approach that we first try to finish the product at a stage where we can actually use it for project developments. And then we like give it to other people that they can use it as well, because then we have the proof that the whole concept is working actually. And yeah. And, and what's your background? Um, our background, uh, so my background, I'm. I'm working for 10 years now in uh, real estate and especially in investment banking. Right, you said, uh, okay. Develop, uh, a few branches, uh, some investment uh, banking boutiques, yeah. And he's more from the buy side. <laughs> and, and, and sorry, I didn't catch, he, he, what is it's his name? I didn't catch it. I'm Aaron, hey. Aaron, hey, the, the, the vegan brothers. Yeah. <laughs> the I, I was uh, in the chat before as well. Yeah. Um, but since we're at like a family's place, we couldn't talk beforehand. Well, you, well, you know, it, that, now you're good. Um, do you, now I, I know you know everyone, but do you have any questions or comments or anything provocative you want to throw at Loretta and Austin? Awesome. And, awesome. Even and, and I think you should. <laughs> I mean, as I said, we were pretty active in the um, in the in the in the chat beforehand. Um, but I'm curious about one thing, actually, um, how like Loretta and probably like the others as well, how they see how the EU um, changed the risk profile of like in this, this example, Mauritius, for example. And uh, what do you think the implications are of that? Well, on the, on the, uh, the blacklisting, um, it, we were the first. To the implications of that, as I don't think there's going to be implications long term. Uh, because we're going to I, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. So give some context no, so, and then, and then so, answer. So the Financial Action Task Force is the big kahuna of regulators globally. Financial Action Task Force stop money mm -hmm. laundering, terrorism financing. And under them, you have securities regulators who, who look after consumer um, and investor protection. Mm -hmm. But we all have to, we all as regulators have to answer into the FATF. Um, the FATF have a, have a, a blacklist country. So they have the power to think if you're laundering money or you're financing terrorism, um, mm -hmm. which comes out of the UN sanctions, that you go on a blacklist, I think. Um, and then Europe have decided that they're going to have their own blacklist. So recently, in the last six months, we got put on the FATF grey list in Mauritius, which we're getting off um, mm -hmm. because we didn't comply with, I think there's 37 methodologies and we didn't comply with two of them. Um, but I work with the ex-head of the FATF and I do work with the FATF. And then over COVID, the European Union put us on a blacklist because they said that they... We were it just, I mean, this is just, I guess, marketing of different regions. So we got to put on a blacklist for different reasons. Um, but we are not the only ones. So there's Botswana, 
I think there's Caymans, there's um, Jamaica, there's a whole lot of countries that go on. But these things are just political. At the end of the day, um, you know, they're, they're also marketing. And once you have methodologies that show that you're not doing the, the bad things like laundering money or you're financing terrorists and you prove them and you have these ongoing methodologies, you, you get off them. So we're, we're fine. I'm not worried about Mauritius. Um, I, yeah, I think these things come and go. And I think every island that you look around, including Caymans, um, BVI, all these jurisdictions that attracted cryptos, even Bermuda, come under the guise of the FATF and we're all going to go through it. So this is um, this is not something new. It's most islands that have um, some sort of legal framework around cryptocurrencies and digital assets are all going to be put on grey lists and black lists over the next two years. But it's just call it course of the, pro, you know, the progress um, until we see how this technology actually plays out and um, we all start to collaborate better. So I, I, would, I don't worry about things like that because I think we've got more important things to worry about. But then they're not good for for marketing, I guess. Um, but other than, other than that, do they have any substance? No, because I know the jurisdictions I deal in, we don't want the money and we don't have terrorists. And there's very good um, companies like things like chain analysis in crypto, in crypto that can actually trace, you know, most of these cryptocurrencies, probably Barbonero and um, Zcash. But, you know, there, there's amazing analytical tools that law enforcement can now use, which is a hell of a lot better um, than what they could do around cash. And my argument always is that cash is the best thing to launder money with because you can't trace mm -hmm. cash at all. It's very hard to uh, it's very hard to launder a Bitcoin because guess what? It's on an immutable, traceable, um, secure database, and you're going to get it found. So um, that's why I guess people like drug dealers use it sometimes because they're not the smartest people in the pack. But they they're going to get caught. Law enforcement are catching up on this faster than you can sneeze. Yeah, and just from a U.S. legal perspective, I'm, I'm, you know, all these wallet address virtual seizures, I think, gives everyone pause. And you know, we, you have to, yeah. I, the the problem with blockchain is it's the blockchain. You know, you, you, it's not going to get lost. No one's going to forget. Yep. It's always going to be there. You can't throw it away. You can't take it off. You know, it's there forever. It's immutable. It's traceable. It's trackable. And you know, things like Bitcoin are not. And there was this big education piece. I think that people going, oh, it's anonymous and it's only used for drug, you know, drug traffickers and whatnot. But it's not anonymous. It's pseudo anonymous. And yeah, you know, every I worked in a lot of operations with security forces around the world. Um, we did a big, um, a big exercise last year. It was with Binance and um, Coinbase, and they they were able to track a whole bunch of, I think it's 700 people across 19 jurisdictions who were um, dealing in child pornography. And they were, because they could use the Bitcoin network and the Bitcoin and they could set move on exchanges, they arrested 450 people in three minutes. It was the biggest ever, um, ever biggest um, what they've ever done in history and they said we couldn't have done that without blockchain or Bitcoin. So, you know, technology is used for good and bad. Um, but it's quite interesting now. So, you, you, the, yeah, law enforcement are now seeing the good side of what, what technology is. The internet was, you know, people said, well, that's going to be good for porn. Look at it now. So, you know, there's good and bad. It's good for porn things. and other things. And other things. And yeah. Bitcoin's good for, for yeah, money and other things. But, um, yeah. but it's just like anything. It's, 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 there's good and bad in everything. Um, and technology is always going to have bad players in it because they're smart. And I always say the good guys are not very good at collaborating. The bad guys collaborate so damn well. Oh, okay, that, that, was a, that was another little knowledge bomb you dropped. Is there a systemic reason for that? So not, what, not just an observation, guys, but why? Because I think when you're you're in the in the world of the dark net and whatever, there's reason to collaborate because you, you um and in, but on the good side we all don't trust each other. This is the other thing where I think blockchain's good because I don't need to trust human intervention. But everybody's skeptical of everybody else. Like governments are skeptical of each other. Um, you know, banks are skeptical of each other. Utility companies are skeptical. We're all skeptical of each other. Nobody trusts anybody. Um, but on the other side of the fence, in the bad the bad world, they all trust each other because they you know, they, they have a um, a united cause not to get caught. Whereas, you know, on the good side, it's funny, we just don't collaborate and cooperate as, as well as we should. And, you, and that, that's a... Sorry, is it, is it that the dark side, they all trust each other or because in the absence of regulatory or contractual enforcement, they can they impose... Well, I think they're also, they're also, they're, they're also extreme risk takers. So they're trusting mm. each other, knowing that they could get stabbed in the face or the back, but the upside is so big. And they're already doing it. They're already breaking the law to, to an extreme. So 
they're like whatever you know they're like the uh the pirates of the old day so yeah i think uh-huh. but i think you're right about it being uh that's why they call it pseudo anonymous right like it's not yeah. it's not very anonymous and it, by design but i guess that um that that speaks to the to the point where people say well what if the government bans it and I'm like why, why would they ban it it's the most traceable money on the planet yeah. yes yeah. It's, and and it could they be would, banned they they could How now that they've turned the money printer on they could they could potentially like short it forever and always mess with the price but it's a wasted endeavor. I don't think they would waste their time doing that. Why would they? Well, it's, it is, I mean, it's interesting because like, so I was talking to someone the other day and I really think this is a great comment. Um, Bitcoin is like the cockroach of the financial system. It's there, mm-hmm. it's annoying, but it's not going to go away. And it's so true. It's, yeah, it's this beast now that's, that, you know, the genie's yeah. out of the bottle and it's not going away. And, and, it's, and it's interesting from where I sit because three years ago, it wasn't mainstream. Like institutional investors were, oh, that's ridiculous. You're an idiot. And when I was a bond trader, everyone told me I was stupid. And yet today I had five bond traders ask me if they should buy Bitcoin. And I said, well, do you normally buy markets on their highs? Yeah, you, know, you decide. Right. But, but, well, on the recent high, who knows where it will be next month? Right. Yeah, but well, I, I saw yesterday. I, the, the third richest guy in Mexico put ten percent of his net worth in yesterday, or at least he announced it. I don't know, who knows when he did it? But yeah, there's all kinds but of people coming out. Like, as a trader, though, and for one for thirty years, you've got to understand there's risk in everything, and what goes up goes down. Nothing goes one way forever, and that, sure. and that's that's across every. I mean, I've traded maybe you know twenty asset classes, and that that's consistent across all of them. So, you know, yeah. it may have a cycle of going up, but you'll get a dip. And they're, and they're for different reasons and different markets do things for different reasons. But um, never, I always say to people, don't ask me for investment advice, but never put more money than you can afford to spend into any asset. This is, this is the, you know, very predictable post-having run-up that we're experiencing right now, right? <laughs> and I think it's fueled even more this time by all the, the Michael Saylors oh, no. and that guy from Mexico and all these... You know, institutional level is. people jumping in. Yeah. yeah. You got, the, the thing that everyone, the, the thing that everyone ignores, and is the key thing around Bitcoin and most of the crypto uh, platforms out there, is that they are effectively anonymous. Not there's no such thing as true anonymity, but they are effectively anonymous until you go to a centralized exchange. Yes. The minute you go to a centralized exchange, you're identifiable. So if you can keep all your transactions off of an centralized exchange, you can launder your money left, right, and center. No one can do a thing. No one can even well, really say who did well, it until you do that. Account. Even better, that's Marco, just leave it. Put it on a, some sort of hardware device. Leave it there, and you have to literally trade that as if it's cash money. Here's a million dollars on a stick. Yeah. Never take it off the stick. That's a million-dollar stick, and it'll only go up in value. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and, 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 and keep it like you know speaking of iron man like embedded in your body so you're never away from yeah. it <laughs> like you know <laughs> like by, like biologically you can put it on your neuro chip fine you know just so long as it's in your so long as it's in your body and it doesn't have wireless <laughs> Yeah, you'd be surprised. I mean, I do a lot of forensic stuff around crypto and you'd be surprised. We can actually, we, we can figure out who the owners is of wallets and, and things now without even it going on chain. Um, the analytics of some of these companies like chain analysis blow my mind. Um, and so, mm-hmm. yeah, and I always say, never never think that anything is impossible because everything is possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of creeping up on the... The time, but uh, I, I want to yep. also and Loretta, you know, just on, on our main theme of energy and power, you, you two have been great, but I just, you know, this is going to be a long tail presentation. This is going to be on YouTube and we're going to spread it throughout multiple channels. Is there mm-hmm. any highlight point, whether it's community electricity, some aspect we didn't get into, is there just any highlight point that you want to discuss or leave us with that's golden that you know, I'd be remiss to, to not get on this show? Hmm. I think we, I think we, for me, we covered, uh, most of everything, um, that, that I wanted to talk about, but, um, I don't know, Loretta, any, anything on your end, something might come to mind while we're chatting. Yeah. I mean, I just think the collaboration, as I keep saying, is a new survival. Mm-hmm. There's, we, the more we all collaborate and the more that we all work together, the better systems become, the better we, the better people we become, the, be, the better way we operate in everything we do in life. And I think uh, the, you know, this community electricity is one of those great things because it has outreaches you know, to health, 
how how if people don't live in polluted um, areas, you know, they can use they can walk to work as opposed to use their car, and they understand they're getting a carbon credits for that. There's a whole lot of new economic and, and social benefits that that we can we can get out of all of this, and I think that's what excites yeah. me the most because I, I think the world until now has been very greedy. It's take 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 or just have overconsumption. Um, and that's put us where we are today, let's be honest. And that's not a great place. And I don't think any of us want to sit here. And I don't think any of us want our kids to sit here in 10 years. Um, so, so I think, yeah, the more we collaborate, the more we can have community-centric things like, um, you know, like electricity grids, the, the better we become as people and the better the society we're going to build. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. OK, Sandra, speaking of collaboration, my good friend. Um, <laughs> I think this is a great show, yeah, and, yeah. you know, and for something that was very spontaneous, you know, again, I, I want to really thank Austin. I want to really thank Loretta. You, you, you know, you stood up and were counted at short notice. This, this was great. This is interesting. I want to thank our guests for coming on. Uh, you know, the new ones, nice to meet you. Uh, Marco, you know, you're, you're, you're like the rock. You're the rock. You should be the German <laughs> brothers, you're, you're, The German brothers. I love the German brothers. Uh, the the Nagel Yes. Boys. Yeah, no, we, Gordon, Tor Torben, I Gordon, the Gordon, Gordon, shout out to you for getting us here last minute too, and Sander, you as well, and oh, Gordon sure. Dixon, you too, for uh, for uh, supporting. We tried to get Gordon to to be a speaker, but at least he got on and talked a little bit too. But Gordon does quite a bit in uh, energy. Gordon, what remind me? What was your uh, claim to fame in uh, in law? You 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 that when I met you, Brock like touted you for for something big you the did other, in the legal realm. Fame, the other Gordon in law. That's ah. it. <laughs> and I, uh, the Gordon, I just connected with you on LinkedIn, and I, I think I want to have He's you on the, the show. I want to have you on the show yes. also. But give us give us a, a, a moment about yourself, and if you want to show your smiling face, feel free. Uh, let's see if I can un unmute here or come back. I on. missed you, Gordon. I'm glad Hi. you're back. Yes, <laughs> I missed you. Uh, so, Gordon, you and I have met yes. around the world conferences a few times, but yep. we we never met in Santa Monica which was kind of, or maybe we have, but we got more acquainted in uh, New York and I think uh, on the on the ship where I met Loretta, um, if I'm not mistaken, yes. but uh, yeah, you guys could have met. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, a couple, I mean, there's, there's a lot of intersection on what this topic is and the where I met Loretta, more than I can really uh, do do justice to them. I mean, there's what they're we're doing a pay as you go uh, single home solar rollout in uh, Ni Nigeria mm. that will wow. blockchain to to track the uh, the the payments and that can evolve from single home solar to nano grid to micro grid. So it'll be interesting to see how that rolls out. Uh, I'm working on a 5G disruptor and layering uh, DLT technology on top of that, and we're um, uh, poised to get a contract to <clears throat> to become the national broadband technology for Chile um, that, that could expand to Peru and Bolivia and Brazil and Dominican Republic. Um, we're close. I think this week we're closing a Series A at 101 million, so that will be exciting. That, that's a uh, crazy size Series A. Is that really is that a true Series A? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not equity there's a debt piece uh as well but, okay but um, even debt uh, over a hundred million in series a I know. yeah yeah it's okay well you know my, my 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 virtual hat is off to you they, they started at, yeah. uh, started at 15 and it's just been a crazy uh awesome rush and it's and it's going uh, I, I look forward to seeing that in tech crunch <laughs> uh it'll <laughs> yeah as soon as the ink is dry the the term sheets which been, is that nice. for Chile or which one is that for? Uh, Wheeling. Oh, nice. Yes. Wheeling oh, is a good, good project. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Wheeling's good. We love that. So, um, and so I want, so th that also is an, is an environment where um, th this topic is relevant in terms of uh, decentralized, mm -hmm. where we're really focusing on creating uh, um, own your own data, self sovereign identity. Uh, and la la layering that on top of this 5G disruptor technology uh, operating network. Um, another one, I mean, there's another one that's kind of interesting called uh, Beyond Imagination mm -hmm. that I'm um, advising that's a uh, avatar uh, project. Uh, Harry Clore 
who uh, is the chief science officer at XPRIZE, is the CEO and founder. And that uh, won't go too much into that, but it's uh, pretty crazy uh, technology. And COVID will accelerate that as well. Um, <clears throat> trying to think. Yeah, where, where uh, are you located now? And how's your COVID life? <laughs> yeah. How's right it 2020? Now, I came up here from Santa Monica and, and COVID hit, and this has been a great spot. So I'm in the uh, Salt Lake area. Mm, okay. Near some. Um, I'm trying to think like Community Electric uh, with Austin. I haven't gotten deeply involved yet, but uh, kind of part of that. that yeah, project. we should pick up the we should pick up the combo again with uh, the wheeling discussion there. I think that was really yep. interesting. Yeah, I agree. I've... Yeah, in fact, they're, they're, we're interested in cross. Reference or, or, or layering uh, community electric on top of the WeLink build outs and vice versa. Uh, I got to go to school. <laughs> All right. Oh, my All right. Right. Well, okay. Gordon, Gordon, <laughs> hey, thanks for jumping on. We're back for school. Okay. It's been a great, Bye, great show. Gordon, I, right. you, let's talk. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. 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 All right. You know, like I said, it, it, this show is like half networking, half knowledge drops. <laughs> yeah. Half, yeah. Half, new, right. half new vocabulary okay. for me, like emerging world. And, world. I, and, I think I, I wanted to give one one bit of uh, one one wrap closure statement for me. So sure. throughout life, there's always been people along the way that you know when you say something as wild as Marco just said, they say "ha, not possible," and they try to convince you not to do it, and that it's false, and that it's untrue, and that you shouldn't even waste your time with it. Mm -hmm. Those are just the naysayers, and you should absolutely ignore them and prove them wrong and laugh at them later. Well, you don't have to laugh at them, but laugh, enjoy that you succeeded because. Uh, too many times in life, a, a software company used to work for, um, I told him, uh, one of the owners of the company, and they're a software company that's supposed to be innovative. I told him, and this was the moment I realized I had to leave. And I was mm -hmm. buying Bitcoin with most of my paycheck back then. That was 2015. Um, at any rate, so it was, it was a software company that was claiming to be innovative. But when I told him that thought to text wasn't too far in the future, because we already have speech to text and blah, blah, blah. Monkeys can already fly planes back then with their, with a little hat, right? Um, you know, or, you know, like a toy helicopter, they could fly around the room. You can, you can imagine an image and it can print it out. That was back then. This is, uh, you know, so when he, when he said, oh, no, that'll never happen. That was the minute I decided to leave. I was like, all right, I think I've uh, already been planning my exit strategy from that company anyways, by doing that, you know, following Bitcoin back then it was around 200 bucks. So it was a good timing, but at any rate, just, just do it, prove them wrong. And uh, yeah. I think Marco, what, what you have is, is fascinating. I want to dive deeper into that. And um, yeah, buy Bitcoin. Definitely still not, wait, maybe wait till it dips a little bit, but definitely buy Bitcoin because it's never, never too late. As I've we all never know, regretted buying Bitcoin. Can... I've always regretted selling it. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Dollar cost averaging, it. guys. Don't it. even care what the price is. Just keep buying chunk every month. You know, it's, it's like, like, like show. sell it. You yeah. will never have I've to buy sell two it. things. That's the thing. I've, I've, I've yeah. been a trader of gold since 1997. So I started buying gold in 1997 and that's never let me down. And so I buy Bitcoin because that's digital gold. So the two assets that yeah. I own most of is gold and digital gold. And, and neither of them have let me down so far that I'm not going to stop. The, you know, the one thing about gold and platinum and everything else, though, if one of these suckers who's trying to mine asteroids is successful, it's going to yeah. just explode the supply. <laughs> Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. let, let, let me jump in. I, I had what I, like I wouldn't call him a friend, but a kind of friend. I, like we were yeah. having a discussion online on Sergey's show, who was in this thing earlier, and I pointed out that the amount of Bitcoin is capped by software, and that the amount of gold is currently not exactly known, and there could be sort of a black swan of it. He got so angry, he started flaming me on Facebook, calling me stupid because he's like really into this whole gold thing. So I'm not gonna say his name, but it's like, you know, I got. I mean, that's funny, but Gold's a funny thing. I started trading gold in 1994. So we didn't have Bitcoin. So, and, and I picked the high and the low of it because I'm a technical trader. I love trading with gold. Because um, I think that's always the thing. When people say, no, don't do it, go and do it. If anyone says no, just go and do it. Okay? And if I had a dollar or a Bitcoin for every time somebody told me that I was an idiot for doing this, um, I'd it's be the, very... It's the very art of contrarian thinking. Okay, everyone, we, we, we are on the time. We're on the clock. So again... Awesome, Loretta, you're rock stars. I really appreciate it. German brothers, you know. Yeah, the with the Eagles. <laughs> yeah, good, good talk. Auf Wiedersehen. You know, feel good. I don't know. You know, you know my, my German sucks. I'm sorry. Uh, Marco, as always. No, uh, Sander, 
you know, here, I need to land the plane and then I'm turning off the report, but land that plane. So, oh, yeah. wait, oh, yeah, hold on. I'm sorry. Of course, I'm lying. We have another show today, everyone. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's okay, right. Don't miss that next show. It's in. It's on every social media I can think of. It's with Eloisa, and we're talking about data as new gold. Speaking of which, what time? What time is that one? In, oh, in yeah. less than four hours. In three, all right, three hours uh, forty forty five minutes. You, so yeah, check my Facebook. Check, check my LinkedIn. Just and yeah. check the, all the all the chats. But yes, it's all right. Zoom. Gonna be all right, no, yeah, Loretta's okay. going to be out. <laughs> yeah, I'll get up soon for No, have some wine. It's all good. Or tea. Sander, sorry for interrupting. Please, as I was saying, please land the plane, my fellow collaborator. No, no, no worries. And I, I fully agree with you. I really appreciate that Loretta and Austin, a spontaneous extra crypto Wednesday show. We, we really like that, uh, like that. And maybe Gordon, because we have our, our friend from Frankfurt, who are now in Munich also, mm -hmm. also here on the show. That once you're in Europe and we're going to do the, once the, the, the post-corona is there, you know, we can do the, the traveling again. We're going to do special hubs throughout Europe. We will also would like to go to Germany, of course. You're invited. So, yeah, yeah, I, I love Germany. I studied there excellent. twice when I was in college at the Goethe Institute. So yes, they're the first people I'm visiting after my daughter is the Nagel Brothers in, in Germany. I'm getting going to Australia, then Germany. Cool. Deutschland. I'm down. I'm, I'm down with Deutschland. <laughs> great great country so to, to wrap up everything so austin and loretta really really thank you for being on the show we would like to re-invite you in future shows so you're always welcome as a speaker or to contribute or you know whatever you would like thank to do this, this is a community uh, and everybody that was, was on the show thank you for joining everybody that watched the recording thank you for watching the recording please share it with as much as people as you can Join our Telegram channel and uh, please um, follow the, the YouTube channel. I think we're fine for now. We see uh, most of the people back in a few hours. Oh. So 8 o'clock Central European time. We have Eloisa and our Italian panel in the show. So Gordon, I see you in a few hours. And thank you, everybody, again. Wish you a good yeah, afternoon. I have, I have Thanks, everybody. Thing to add. Um, I have a hashtag and it's, we're, we're all in this together. So I'm happy for you to all hashtag that on social media because I think we all are. All right. Beautiful. Hashtag we're all, we all together. Great. together. We're going to do it. Yep. Thank you, Loretta. Right. Thanks, guys.